insurance companies will look at the pharmacoeconomic studies. It's so obvious when you look at patients who are on cannabis, um, how much the, the money savings over yeah. traditional pharmaceuticals. The complexity of the plant is leading to a myriad of, of therapeutic benefits that I never would have predicted. You know, I've been running around the country now for 10 years trying to persuade the public to, to look at this and see the injustice of this monopoly and, and how, you know, just the absurdity that their taxpayer dollar, millions of taxpayer dollars going to fund this year after year. But botanical medicine seemed to offer the most hope for patients to treat a variety of illnesses all with one intervention. That You're yeah. seeing people's lives being completely transformed. Um, their entire worldview has been changed. The way they interact with other people, with nature, it's this whole thing of the doctor is God and we're supposed to be micromanaging every aspect of patient's life. I don't like that. I, I want to empower the patients to make their own good decisions about their wellness. I try to just give them a menu of options of things that might be helpful and then we decide together rather than me sitting on a pedestal ordering them around, you know? Even though someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host Alan Sakian. We're on site at the beautiful New West Summit, the Cannabis Tech Conference. We are now sitting down with Dr. Sue Sisley. Yes. Hi, Sue. Hey, Alan. How you doing? Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming Absolutely. on Absolutely. I'm so excited for this conversation. <laughs> me too. Sue works in internal medicine, president and principal investigator at Scottsdale Research Institute. Mm -hmm. And with your mother, Hannah, yep. uh, formed the reportedly the only mother-daughter MD physician team in Arizona. It's true, man. It's true. There aren't many mother-daughter doctor teams, period. There are a lot of father-son teams, but, you know, there are not that many. It, it's too much estrogen in the room. It just doesn't work well, but we tolerated each other. We actually, that was a fabulous, I was 20 years, I was in practice with her and I just learned so much and she wow. just retired recently at age 80 I finally let her retire <laughs> so now she's 86 and all she does is watch the news all day and smoke weed it's like an unbelievable transformation she's had her favorite strain is green crack she's always <laughs> asking where's my green crack Sue I'm like oh god this is awful my mom's a stoner now this is a disaster <laughs> uh, when did when did your fascination with uh, medicine kick in when you were young how did you pick up your journey into yeah you know? i really um had no clue about cannabis as a medicine at all until um, about maybe 15 years ago, the veterans in my medical practice were telling, were claiming that they were benefiting from it. And I was super skeptical at that point. I was just like rolling my eyes, thinking these guys are just addicted, you know, stoners that are trying to get high. And I, and it took me years to really um, kind of re, uh, reformulate my thinking because I was just so blocked. I, you know, when you go through the uh, very conservative medical training, you only view FDA approved medicines as real medicine. And so I just couldn't wrap my head around the idea that this plant, uh, that I, I, we'd only been trained that it was dangerous and addictive. So we couldn't fathom that this could be medicine. And I feel really awful about that now because I feel I was so judgmental and these veterans were truly benefiting, but I couldn't um, accept that. So it took me, you know, really the vets plus all their family members coming yeah. in and trying to corroborate their stories and slowly, you know, luckily these guys never gave up on me. The vets just kept coming back and trying to persuade me of their experiences. And, um, and then I started losing a lot of vets in my medical practice to suicide and I still was, you know, wow. couldn't comprehend that the cannabis might be life-saving for them, but I was, um, um, you know, I would see a lot of them would 
you know, w when they were on cannabis, they were able to taper themselves off opioids and heroin, uh, you know, other, uh, a lot of them were addicted to pain pills from the VA because that it was just so easy for the VA to prescribe mega dosages of opioids all the time. And then, um, then these guys would graduate, they'd get cut off their pain pills when the VA realized they were hooked and they would end up graduating to heroin and other street drugs. And so that's how we would lose a lot of veterans to suicide, was they would just get strung out on so many street drugs after being, you know, getting addicted on pharmaceuticals through their VA experience. So now the VA is pulled back and they're re recognizing the damage that's been caused by all this polypharmacy. But in the meantime, you know, so many lives have been lost and, um, you know, and I feel responsible for a lot of it. Like I, I played a role, I was, Part of that machine that was prescribing all these pills, um, but I I never felt good about it. That was the thing that I remember was that I always viewed these pills as very toxic, and so I always um, would try to seek alternatives. But there was really nothing else in the mainstream that was you know that was realistic, and then and that's how we started getting becoming aware of cannabis and, and started seeing, you know, when I had this incredible gift to partner with MAPS, you yeah. know, when Rick Doblin first found me, I don't know if it's been like 14 years ago now, I think when he first um, saw me working on the legalization campaign in Arizona and he was looking for a principal investigator for a cannabis trial yeah. and, uh, and that's how it all began and <laughs> so I'm so grateful to him because he really put me on this path to examining um, plant-based medicines and realizing that there's more than just FDA-approved medicines. And so, um, plus all the veterans that you had coming to you and telling you about their experiences. Yeah. Yes. And that changing, and plus also losing some to. Oh yeah, suicide. we lost so many, and I mean, it was um, heartbreaking to work with the families after we have this uh, charity called Grasp where um, this, the parents who've lost children come together to console each other and I would go to these wow. meetings just riddled with guilt because I felt like I was um, part of that machine, you know, that was pummeling them with all these prescriptions and I was, I'm so desperate to find now medically active plants that could be a substitute for these really t difficult, you know, toxic pharmaceuticals. And so, I'm, you know, I'm not anti-pharma. I just am frustrated with pharma yeah, because yeah. it feels like they're suppressing work like this. You know, yeah. when people are trying to put plant-based medicines through the FDA process, I feel like pharma is playing a role in stonewalling this work, even though it's not obvious, right? They're not coming out publicly and saying that, but by writing giant pack checks to electeds who we know are opposed to this and keeping the, the campaign contributions flowing, all that. We can't even track that anymore, right? Since the Supreme Court, you know, the Citizens United decision, we can't follow all this dark money anymore. We used to be able to see this money trail going from pharma to electeds, from private prisons to electeds and all that, but now all you have are these independent expenditure committees. You don't even know how them up. But we know that their history, their tradition has always been to target electeds that they know are gonna keep, like what we just talked about here at New West, keeping this government enforced monopoly at the University of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. You know, that will guarantee that cannabis research is never allowed to flourish in the U.S. As long as University of Mississippi is the only federally legal drug supply for every cannabis clinical trial in the nation means that we'll never be able to fully understand cannabis as a medicine through controlled trials. And so, meanwhile, other countries will just dominate the research space. That's it. They're already, all these foreign countries are miles ahead of us, and at this point, we may never be able to catch up because they all have multiple growers for research. They're able to study diverse phenotypes that are r real, real world cannabis, readily available in all their markets. And, um, and even if the DEA announced tomorrow that they were really going to process these applications, 
it would still take these companies years to get up and running. You know, it's not like they're just magically poof, they're, they've got cannabis to sell to scientists. It's going to take years for them to, you know, multiple grow cycles before they reach what the government considers GMP grade cannabis. So I'm worried that, you know, we're falling so far behind. And that's why a lot of our work is involved with, um, you know, partnering with foreign entities to try to do this research because other countries where it's federally legal, it's so much more permissive, the environment to move forward. And so we could partner with people in Australia, with Colombia, all these mm -hmm. groups that are already federally legal. But um, in the meantime, you know, these guys, the patients in our country are going to be stuck with a full, um, the full freight, the full cost of this cannabis because insurance companies will never pay for this until it's FDA approved. So that's been the problem. I've had a couple instances, I will admit, where we've gotten um, disability insurance um, to, to pay. It's like a single case agreement where a patient can get their um, cannabis paid for, but the, the co insurance company only reimburses the patient. They're not gonna pay the dispensary, so, and that's fine, but it's a good start, and it gives me some hope that maybe insurance companies will look at the pharmacoeconomic studies. It's so obvious when you look at patients who are on cannabis, um, how much the, the money savings over yeah. traditional pharmaceuticals, it's so, so yes. clear. Now, take us into this period of the last 14 years of what you've been doing in the industry as a physician, how you've been leading that. Yeah, I, you know, the, the challenge when, you know, MAPS and I began trying to spearhead this study and we realized we were like just systematically impeded by the government at every step. Um, we, it, it was taking so many years that I, that's when I started partnering with the industry serving as a volunteer medical director for all these different license holders around the country. And so at this point now, I'm a medical director in 17 states, I counted, from wow. Hawaii to, you know, to, to all the way to New Jersey and all these states in between. I'm helping guide these industry folks on how to manage their operations from a medical, from a health perspective, how to promote wellness, but also minimize side effects, how to, um, how to educate patients about, you know, ca ca how to carefully use cannabis and minimize the adverse events. So, um, so that's been my role, and that's how I've learned the most about cannabis, because if I was just waiting for the study to get approved, you know, I would have lost all these years of, of the chance. So working with these license holders has given me a chance to be with patients on the front lines, which has been great. I've learned so much from them about all the different formulations and how it affects them. And the one thing I've, I've really- For all the complex health yes, and wellness benefits. That's uh, the thing that is I didn't understand how, um, you know, the, the complexity of the plant is leading to a myriad of, of therapeutic benefits that I never would have predicted. Um, and it's added, you know, more and more curiosity for me and, and kind of driven me toward this litigation against the DEA because now I'm realizing that um, there's all these unique um, delivery methods that I can't even access through the current monopoly. Like, for instance, there are so many patients that claim that juicing raw cannabis flower it benefits them, especially people who have autoimmune diseases like arthritis or... Uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, things like that. They're juicing the plant and then drinking it and they're getting way better results than anything I could produce by writing the scripts for steroids and other things. So, um, so I've been really persuaded by that, but yet I could never get fresh flour to study from University of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. They just don't have any provision for that. And that's why it's so essential that we end this monopoly and that we get private growers, like with MAPS, has a partnership with University of Massachusetts and Lyle Craker. And Dr. Craker is the most deserving scientist I know for receiving a, a, a federal, you know, Schedule One license to grow for research. It would be incredible if I could buy cannabis from him and buy, you know, his fresh flower, you know, right off the harvest 
and be able to administer that to patients through juicing because I want to be able to replicate what they're doing in a controlled trial so I can understand. I'd like to measure lots of things like the pharmacokinetics of, of how the orally you know, ingested cannabis flower is being absorbed into the mm. blood and the urine and, mm -hmm. um, and to be able to document the, yeah. the, the cytokines, you know, how the, the fresh flower is affecting the inflammatory pathway. Why is it that these people are getting such Healthier. remarkable results. I'm just mystified by that. So and, for every yeah. single one of the uh, possibilities with the uh, ingestion or the topical yeah. or however it is, the application of different cannabinoids, different dosages, for all of the different health and wellness benefits, therapeutic effects, yeah. we need to more rapidly create the process of being able to run the controlled tests and trials. We have to because otherwise um, the patients, I mean, that's what patients tell me all the time, Sue, we don't need your trials because we know it's helping. So, um, and I agree with them that, uh, you know, I, I, um, I support their, uh, how do I say this? Like, I understand that their subjective experiences with and their, the way they're benefiting, but, um, but I deal with a medical community that's very conservative thinking. And, and when you're dealing with uh, health departments or elected officials, you have to have data from randomized controlled trials. That's it. But the sad thing is like with the veteran study I did with MAPS, 10 years it took us to get that trial across the finish line. So I understand why patients can't wait for that. Like they need safe legal access to lab tested cannabis now. They can't wait for the results of FDA controlled trials. But in the so, same, so you just took this into your hands and said, I'm going to sue the DEA right. because of the monopoly on the University of Mississippi on the use of production of cannabis that is then being used for all the clinical trials. Right. I mean, this was something that MAPS has been working on for two decades now. They've been str striving to dismantle this monopoly and persuade the government to license other growers. But their initial litigation was was successful, but then lost on appeal. So this is just so unjust that the government perpetuating this monopoly using our taxpayer dollars to allow you know this monopoly, the, 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 all the apathy also that's bred from monopolies. So so all I was doing was trying to riff off of what Rick Doblin and the team at Maps has been doing all this time, which is they've been trying to use the court system for a remedy to this monopoly. It wasn't successful initially. They had a partnership with a, a, a law firm that was, you know, it's tough. When these law firms take cases pro bono, you know, you're not going to be their top priority. So I was really fortunate to, you know, be able to identify this, this really dedicated young, you know, law team that came, you know, that jumped on board as soon as they heard the story when we I, you know, I've been running around the country now for 10 years trying to persuade the public to, to look at this and see the injustice of this monopoly and, and how, you know, the, just the absurdity that their taxpayer dollar, millions of taxpayer dollars going to fund this year after year. And so I'm trying to ignite this national conversation and suddenly there happen to be these two young attorneys that heard the message at a lecture that South by Southwest and said, Whoa. we need to help her. She's, <laughs> you know, and how rare, like, it's so unusual to find attorneys that want to do something without being paid and they just wow. sense that this was um, a massive... Um, Aligned with them spiritually. Yeah, that's it. Right. They said this is a, an attack on scientific freedom and we have to fix this. And they knew that they had the skills to do it. Whoa. And the fact that they weren't involved in cannabis at all. They never had a cannabis client. They just felt so strongly that this needed to be fixed. So it's great That's to so see cool. that it gives you like a kind of renews your faith in humanity when because yeah. lawyers get such a bad rep for being yeah. greedy. And uh, these guys are the opposite. And they managed to persuade their law firm, which is super conservative firm in Texas, Whoa. To, to let them take this on and they've been really pleased with the, how much traction they've been getting. And even you know the team at MAPS has just 
incur you know, MAPS has got to be so laser focused right now on getting MDMA yeah. through the FDA approval process. Yes. They were happy to have somebody else, you know, kind of grab this baton and run yeah. with it. I yeah. think Rick is really <laughs> pleased to see this yeah. moving forward, you know, and he's been hugely supportive because this was really his vision. He taught me about the um, the the unfairness of the monopoly and and trained us to um, to fight against this. And that's the best thing about working for Maps for a nonprofit is that they allow you to have political opinions and express them. They actually nurture that. Whereas with other, you know, if I had another study sponsor, they wouldn't be so welcoming of that attitude. And you could see what happened to us at the University of Arizona when we had um, political opinions and expressed them at the legislature or anywhere we could find. Um, we ultimately, the university terminated me and the study um, and left us homeless for you know over a year. We were struggling to find a new location, but now we ended up in this great you know giant log cabin in the middle of Cave Creek, Arizona, where we're you know we've created a really therapeutic environment for patients to come and um, and and get you know and participate in clinical trials. But also, what we're hoping is that we'll be a home for MDMA expanded access. That's my real. Um, dream wow. is to be able to side by side to have the cannabis clinical trials alongside of an expanded access clinic where patients could go and get you know potentially life-saving treatment through MDMA assisted therapy and I know we have a long way to go you know to get all the approvals in place for that but I'm hoping by the end of 2020 that we'll be able to rep you know start recruiting patients and seeing if, mm -hmm. if uh, we mm -hmm. can provide that, and then down the road, who knows what? Uh, opening up other doors for medically active plants besides, yes. you know, maybe yes. psilocybin or yes, ayahuasca, yes. whatever we can find. But the idea is that decrim nature. Yes, we just had Carlos I love on. that. Yeah. Carlos yeah. is Which incredible is what he's doing, and he's yes. like lighting a fire under all these states to see that um, this is not right. You know. But, uh, wasting taxpayer dollars chasing people but for a natural plant is uh, insane and um, and it's just inhumane. So I think, um, yeah, I'm hoping that eventually we're going to see all of these plant-based medicines getting through the FDA approval process and really giving pharma a, a big competition because Pharma is getting very lazy. Like you're seeing all that they're, they're not really creating novel medications anymore. We're not seeing new mechanisms of action. All they're doing is reformulating their same old molecules and repatenting them so they can continue to make tons of money. Um, whereas, you know, I think plant, but botanical medicine seem to offer the most hope for patients to treat a variety of illnesses, all with one intervention. That's mm to me the most exciting and that's why you know my enthusiasm for cannabis research has waned so much because I'm looking at the data from you know our controlled trial where we were forced to use government cannabis and you know the results are really disappointing and um, and whereas when you look at the data from MAPS phase two trial with MDMA, and it's extraordinary. You're yeah. seeing people's lives being completely transformed. Um, their entire worldview has been changed. The way they interact with other people, with nature, it's just, um, and I think the, probably the most hope I have is for palliative care, right? So. Yeah because that's the bulk of my, I'm an internal medicine doc, so I do a lot of work with people at the end of life yeah. and a lot of work with hospice. And hospice has not been open to this yet, but I'm, I'm eager to see as we get these drugs through FDA approval that may, they'll finally start to embrace this because um, when you're at the end of life and you're, fa you, you're struggling with this, what we got, this existential anxiety, just riddled, with brutal fear of death that does not respond to benzodiazepines and stuff like that, um, the, the chance that instead of pummeling these people with morphine and all these super sedating meds, um, the chance that they could be utilizing psychedelics carefully, judiciously yes. to, to 
relieve themselves of that. That that existential anxiety just melts away oh, with LSD and MDMA, and suddenly these people are no longer afraid. They're able to enjoy their families and be with you know really engage with their families as they face death. And I'm I've already put that in my um, uh, how do you call that my um, what, what is oh, the, the, the uh, pr power of attorney and the yeah, yeah. yeah I mean I basically instructed my power of attorney when I'm at yeah. the end of my life that I want to be dosed with if I'm in a vegetative state and I'm not able to mm -hmm. to request this that I want that because I know that I've seen the way these people have just um, ha have have begun you know it's almost like a whole new chapter where they're able to really get through um, death without, and they, yeah. they, they talk about love and light and it's a whole nother person. So I, yeah. I'm really excited by that. And I think that eventually the, the classically trained psychiatrists will start to embrace this too, just like ketamine, you know, got, a pro I mean, sure, it's a pharmaceutical grade S ketamine, but it's still um, a step in the right, where psychedelics now being FDA approved and Hopefully, we'll see that door continue to crack open. Yeah. You're really seeing this from top down in so many different ways. I love it. So right. I know, I, especially you know, when you take us through the the trajectory of like where it's going through, uh, both uh, you know yourself doing um, clinical trials for cannabis, yeah, and so that's you guys doing this, and then all the way to you know this future where you also see it part of uh, our, our 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 death, the process of planning our death yes. process. I mean, these are things that are uh, we don't like, we gotta talk about these yeah. things more and make them more Dude. common to talk about and and what properties does a uh, cannabis and, and the use of entheogens have on our uh, spiritual ascension yes. and and what can that do for our global harmony and unity yeah. and prosperity and maximizing people's creativity and abilities and so right. uh, I want to know from you though this is yeah. this one's really important because we've been asking this quite a bit yeah. um, the question is this emerging market uh, has uh, a kind of, it's actually quite important that specifically this one, uh, as well as like decentralization technology, blockchain, cryptocurrency technology, mm -hmm. like <laughs> that one too, yep. that these emerging markets, that the fruits become distributed and democratized yes. rather than concentrated. That's so how, how mm. do you see the inclusive stakeholding fabric that can be made in order to ensure that's the thing that scares me the most is that this becomes a treatment only for people of wealth because right now until it gets FDA approved and health insurance pays for it it's going to people are going to be self pay on treatments that may cost 10 to 15,000 dollars per patient and that means that it will be highly exclusive i'm hoping like in our clinic we hope to charge people of of with high high net worth um, to try to charge them double the amount so that they can help pay for indigent patients that wouldn't normally be able to afford it. But that's the only mechanism I can think of right now until we finally get health insurance coverage. And even then, you know, coverage is going to be uh, difficult. It will probably require prior authorization and you know how doctors hate to go through these extra layers of bureaucracy. but. We have to push for that because otherwise this will become, it'll either become, you know, strictly for patients in the underground who can pay a lesser price or it'll be for you know, people of wealth and the other folks won't have access. And we have millions of patients who are suffering with PTSD. We don't have any new treatments in 18 years. The U.S. has never approved a new treatment since Prozac, I'm sorry, since Paxil and Zoloft. So we're desperate to find new, um, you know, interventions. But if we aren't careful, yeah, it'll end up being just for people of means. And I hate to think about that. And we also have uh, the, another issue that, you know, how do we, like in Arizona, I work uh, very extensively with the Native American community. I do mm. telemedicine with the tribes. And mm. The tribes, um, many of them already employ medically active plants in their ceremony. So yeah. they're already familiar with things like peyote and ayahuasca and things. But they, um, the problem is that 
some of these other, like when it comes to something like MDMA, they're not open to that. And I am mm -hmm. worried that, that they will, like because we don't have Native American therapists, like it's gonna be so crucial that the, the teams of therapists that are trained over the next five years have to represent people of color and all different um, factions of our communities because otherwise yes. if, if the therapists don't reflect that then it's going to be unlikely we can bring those people into those clinics and get them to accept the treatment because they won't um, be trusting of us you know if it's just a bunch of white people that are saying no this is good for you I mean the tribes have been through that before and they know how that turned out when they trusted white people so um, so it's going to be really crucial that, and I know MAPS is making that a high priority in the way they're training people. They're trying to create scholarships for people of color to get trained as a priority so that we can have a very diverse therapist community right out of the gate. And that way we can, you know, persuade whether it's, you know, there's still tons of, um, of antiquated ideas from especially in um, communities like African American, Native American communities that are, that are skeptical about the potential of MDMA as a medicine. And we're gonna have to do a lot of education to make them realize that this is legitimate medicine. So I'm hoping that by starting by um, making sure the therapy teams are diverse is gonna be the first step and then doing tons of outreach in the communities, little, you know, kind of mini town halls and round tables with them, really sitting down with them at dinner and explaining yeah. what, what the, how this can work. Uh, you know, like especially in Native American communities, so there's so much trauma there at all levels. Um, trauma is like day in and day out for them. And if MDMA could, or, or psilocybin, or what it could be a potential therapy, then we've got to make that available to them. And, and we've got to find ways to reduce the cost of the treatment. Right now, yes. it's massive. And um, if there's any way MAPS can slowly pare down the number of hours that are really needed to do the you know, pre-flight training and the you know, post-integration, um, or if there's ways for them to um, think about group therapy settings or employing telemedicine, those are all things that might be able to reduce costs. But um, yeah, we have to think very shrewdly, otherwise it's gonna end up being a very narrow group of people that benefit, you know? Do you see this, since you have such a macro perspective on things, do you see this as a massive awakening consciously, spiritually of the entire planet to rise to the grand challenges that are upcoming? I, I am really impressed with how this has um, taken off, but there's still a massive amount of, of uninformed people. So there's the groups that have experimented with this who already are enlightened and they know the value of, of psychedelics, but then there's still tons, especially in the older generations, that um, are not ready to embrace the idea because there was so much um, you know, cultural misinformation out of the 60s and 70s that has colored people's thinking for decades after now. And you know, let's face our government waged a really, you know, shrewd campaign against psychedelics for so many years and it's going to be tough to, um, to, to to change that trajectory but that's why the data is so important because with science I'm hoping you know if, if we can get date rigorous controlled data published in peer-reviewed medical journals yeah. That's going to be able to game changer. Yeah, I think the world so, view is for sure. If we're yeah, making the progress happen faster and getting elected uh, officials, officials to yeah, make make yeah. decisions based on science rather than hysteria and old emotions. And so, um, but the best thing that happens is by the more and more people who are trying it, they're being transformed. Like for instance, in my case, I've never tried any psychedelics yet. I still have not had that. Um, but I intend to have it next year. I'm getting ready to become an MDMA therapist to be able to work in my own clinic. And part of the MAPS training is that you have to actually use, you have to go through an MDMA session with the trained therapist so that you can experience that. And then you 
have the empathy then to guide people later. So I'm so yes, happy that yeah. MAPS uh, designed the training that way, that you go through the, the meat of the training beforehand and then you actually get to dose the MDMA in a structured environment. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward, because I wasn't willing, I was n afraid to use MDMA outside of that type of structured environment. Um, but now they're giving me a chance to do so. I think uh, I yeah, can't wait yeah. to talk to you yeah. afterwards because I, I have a, a strong suspicion that I will um, also be, you know, um, very, you know, m my mindset will be completely different afterward. And I'm hopeful about that because I want to know what that's about and I want to be able to yeah. guide patients through that later. So, um, but yeah, I mean, so all of the insight I have is just from observing patients all these years. I've spent hours and hours with patients uh, and, and friends and colleagues who've used psychedelics and I've learned from them and I've asked um, questions over and over to try to gain understanding and um, yeah, I mean, I think that all of us are have tons of hope for psychedelics to cure more than just medical conditions but of course to provide spiritual growth to, to Cure, uh, you know, big conflicts. Like if, you know, you think yeah. about the conflicts in the Middle East. My parents are Israeli, so I know firsthand how um, how, how brutal that is. You know, what's happened for so many decades there is seems impenetrable. Like, how could we possibly fix this? We've had all kinds of, you know, interventions from government, elected officials, and treaties, and nothing has helped. And so you wonder what can change people biologically that could make them open to having uh, a humane discussion with someone. I mean, I know that when I was, you know, it, it, most Israelis are raised to believe that um, the Arabs that they're surrounded by are, are their enemy and that they could never trust them or be able to have relationships with them, you know, friendships. And, um, and so the, the idea that psychedelics could provide them the opportunity to, to have meaningful interactions and realize that they're not the enemy um, yeah. is, a, is a wonderful concept. And I'm hoping we get to, you know, I'm hoping that governments will employ psychedelics in that way later. But I don't know, it's gonna take a lot of work. And that's yes. why it's so great that MAPS is doing the MDMA, one of their clinical trial sites is in Israel, and maybe yeah, yeah. someday they'll that's, be that's in Palestine right. yeah. and we'll be able to start bringing people together. To get this myriad of health and wellness benefits, of spiritual growth benefits, that uh, to, to have the fruits of the emergent market be democratized, it's going to require a lot of, you know, protocol, like regulatory shifts, um, you know, these yeah. clinical trials to see, to continue, like you said, this big literally stop with the monopoly with the yeah. University of Mississippi so that um, we can continue doing these right, again, these rice randomized control trials. Can we yeah. continue doing the things that we need to do in order to ensure that the awakening can happen as yeah. fast as possible? Um, okay, yeah. one question that we like asking our guests okay. on the way out of the show, and then we'll revisit and we'll do round two again. And then <laughs> okay, we'll you got it. Yeah. So we'll do a deeper dive right, as well, right. of course. We'll go deeper. Um, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Ooh, boy, oh boy. I mean, I, I have to say, for me, it's, um, this is gonna sound super cheesy, but um, the thing that makes me happiest is watching live theater. I you know that sounds crazy, but I, I've always been completely enamored with watching people play out their, you know, yes. stories on stage and and the, just the joyfulness of like live musicals and things like that. So for me, that's beauty is watching live art playing out on stage and um, and seeing people have these like almost euphoric experiences and then that that real subtle interaction with the audience and breaking the fourth wall yeah. and so yeah, so yes. to me that's like 
brings meaning to my life personally. Um, and just I, like, you know, isn't this itself theater yeah, for some, exactly. someone else it watching? Could be, it could be. It could be. Yeah. I, you don't have to have costumes and all that. And, but I mean, I, a big yeah. planet, theater as a planet, <laughs> exactly. as a as a species. That's it. They say all planet. the world's a stage, and we're all actors. Dude. So this is <laughs> it, man. We're, we're doing it right now. So yeah, I would say that's beauty to me. There's the connection yeah. in between why you like that is because you yourself play a. a that's a, a, it. I play. We play I'm, our characters. Yeah, we do. I mean, I'm you know, as doctors, you know, we feel like we're often. Um, it, it, it seems that we're actors, but I've always been resisted that because I feel like being with a patient means you've got to be real. And I don't like putting on the white coat and donning all the pretentious bullshit of uh, doctoring. So I feel like that's why I have such meaningful interactions with my patients because they know that I'm human and that I don't buy into all the trappings of, you know. So yeah. I'm hoping that we can, I mean, and I think that's what's made me the, capable of being open to other, that this whole thing of the doctor is God and we're supposed to be micromanaging every aspect of mm -hmm. patient's mm -hmm. life. I don't like that. I, I want to empower the patients to make their own good decisions about their wellness. I try to just give them a menu of options of things that might be helpful and then we decide together rather than me sitting on a pedestal ordering them around you know yeah. so that's always worked well for me and my mom and uh i know the patients especially with my mom she's like an incredible physician i was really lucky to be taught by her yeah. for so long i learned yeah. so much so yeah, so anyway. So keep up this thank great Thank you, work. bud. Thank I appreciate you. your time, man. Thank you. you got it. Thank you, thank huh? You. you got it, bud. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for tuning yeah. in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Check out the links to Sue's work in the bio below. Please check it out. Support it. Also, check out the links to New West Summit as well in the bio below. Also, support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders, the community organizers across the world that you believe in. Support them. Help them grow. You can support Simulation. Our links are below to our show as well. And also, go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Catalyze this emergent renaissance yes. that's happening. We love you very much. We'll see you soon. Yeah. Peace. Yeah, bud, good job, man. You're awesome. Good job, Sue. That, was, that fun. was fun. You are such a good uh, interviewer. You're I so swear. nice. We we yeah. should uh, we'll do round two when, okay. when after we can, MDMA. After MDMA, yeah, let's I do think round that two. would be helpful.